Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Parha. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming uh, virtually or digitally, I don't know, Zoomly. Uh, many a time, as I have said in the audience, and uh, uh, Roma has introduced our speaker, uh, they have invariably thanked her and Franco for their impeccable hospitality and their uh, uh, attention to details. So this time, uh, I was the receiving end of both of these, and I thank them in, immensely for their uh, efficiency and attention to every detail. Uh, my talk is something between uh, a book talk and a talk about Saudian humanism. Uh, in a book talk, uh, one would uh, give a synopsis of the book <clears throat> and then maybe read passages and then open it to question and answer. But the book is in Persian. Uh, and I suspect if I do read it, uh, some of you might not uh, understand the Persian version yet. Uh, hopefully you'll take classes at Stanford uh, or other places. <clears throat> so uh, this combination is going to be what I'm going to try to uh, do. Uh, give you a sense of what the book is about and give you a sense of why I think the subject is uh, uh, important. Uh, if this was, uh, Ironically, late 19th century, for example, and we were at uh, Stanford uh, in the East Coast somewhere, or the Stanford of the East Coast somewhere, uh, Saadi would be much better known to many uh, Americans in this audience. Uh, Iranians, I, I think then and now, probably equally uh, would have been familiar with who Saadi is because he is a giant in Iranian uh, letters uh, as a giant in Iranian culture. But in 19th century, late 19th century, he was also deemed to be a giant in world history. Uh, before world history was a concept, Goethe talked about him as one of the icons of world history. Emerson talked of him uh, as being someone as wise as the Bible, although Emerson had read little of him uh, and had read it in translation. And translating, sadly, is very, very difficult but uh, they would have been familiar with it. Today, of Persian poets, uh, Rumi, for example, or Attar, for example, I think are much more familiar in the uh, Western world than Saadi, and I think that's a great loss. Because uh, with no hyperbole, uh, my colleague and I uh, have made the argument that Saadi is no less than Shakespeare in terms of his wisdom, in terms of the depth of his understanding of the human condition, in terms of the pluralities of forms and uh, uh, genres that he uses to describe this human condition. Uh, and it is our hope in this book uh, to re-imagine uh, this aspect of Saadi, Saadi and humanism. And I will uh, try to describe why I think this uh, aspect of Saadi is particularly important. Uh, I wrote an essay on Saadi some 20 years ago. It was Saadi on politics. That essay is included in this new collection, but the rest of the collection is uh, the work of uh, my dear colleague, uh, uh, Professor uh, Mirzadeh, and myself. Uh, Saadi lived in uh, Shiraz, Iran, uh, Shiraz, a place that at that time and all the way to late 19th century was a center for growing grapes and grape wines. The Shiraz wine is an absolute gift of that city to the world. Uh, but the Shiraz was also a center of uh, learning, a center of poetry. Uh, Saadi spent much of his life traveling. He was not someone who would stay in one place spent almost 30 years traveling and traveled much around the world. There were some controversies about whether every place that he has written about, uh, he has actually traveled to, but he has virtually traveled the entire Central Asia, India, parts of China, uh, North Africa, and everywhere he writes, uh, people knew of him. So sadly, he is a very self-assured writer. Uh, has what Hans Blumenberg in his 
magnificent book on modernity called uh, Self-Assertive Individualism. Saadi is very self-assertive in describing his uh, own uh, importance and in his own greatness. He's not, never hyperbolic, he is never bombastic, but he's also never falsely humble. Uh, Nietzsche, I think, said it very well, uh, that false humility is the greatest sign of arrogance, and you cannot accuse Saadi of arrogance. He knows exactly what his, uh, value, uh, the value of his work is, and he goes out of his way to uh, describe it. Uh, and one of the complexities of trying to write about Saadi, uh, particularly if you're trying to cover the entire opus, is that he was very prolific, and he was very prolific in several different genres. He is easily considered one of the greatest prose writers of Persian history. He is easily considered one of the greatest poets. There are critics, and I'll tell you some uh, uh, about them, a little bit about them, who, this, who have dismissed his poetry, but uh, we think uh, for very wrong reasons. He's one of the great satirists. Uh, his satire was so daring in 13th century that in 20th century Iran, when they collected his work, they did not dare publish him. Uh, some of his work of satire is uh, still not included in the collected works. Some of them are included, but they have been bleeped out because they think that he is so ribald, he is so open talking about many things, making fun of uh, many people, and making fun of uh, uh, falsely pious people, is one of his uh, favorite pastimes. Praising wine also is one of his favorite pastimes. And I can tell you with some certainty that the wine he praises ain't the wine spiritual that some of the religious folks would like to attribute. He actually praises wine and is very well uh, uh, informed about uh, some of its uh, values. Uh, now, uh, we are going to be uh, here talking about uh, his humanism, and our argument in the book is that Sadi is truly a humanist long before humanism uh, became a catchword in the, in the West. Uh, in other words, if you read uh, different people who have written about modernity, from Ernest Kasserer uh, to uh, Greenblatt uh, to Isaiah Berlin, humanism is said to be one of the centerpieces of modernity. And I think it is, we think it is. Modernity without some, uh, humanism really doesn't make sense. But at least 200 years before this becomes a catchphrase in the West and becomes a central concept in modernity and becomes a defining characteristic of a new paradigm, a new paradigm of modernity that changes everything about how we look at ourselves, how we look at the world, how we look at religion, how we look at nature, how we look at knowledge, uh, sadly, had many, many of those characteristics that we would identify as quintessentially uh, humanist. Uh, Sadi is also remarkable in the role that he has had in preserving and uh, fine tuning the Persian language. This is someone who wrote 800 years ago. This is someone who wrote before Chaucer. But uh, read a little bit of Chaucerian English now and read Sadi, and you see the difference. Sadi is as contemporary, as understandable, as sublimely beautiful, as sublimely simple as any modern writer. Sadi, I think, rightfully uh, must be accredited to having a role equal to Shahnameh. Shahnameh is a great epic of Persian poetry. It is uh, a thousand years old. Uh, almost everyone uh, accepts that Persian language as a bastion of Persian identity, Iranian identity, as a bastion of identity different from the Arab identity that came to Iran through uh, the Mas Islamic conquest. Uh, Saadi, we say, helped preserve that. But I think no less important, and in some ways, as some linguists have argued, even more important is the role that uh, Saadi played. Uh, the multiplicities of uh, his discourse, uh, not just his ability to write poetry, to write epic poetry, to, love, to write love poetry, 
but to write, write prose in a brilliant, succinct, parsimonious, precise manner, and the way we would expect of a humanist uh, to write. One of the characteristics of humanism in the West was the rise of people who began to write in the language of everyday people. One of the traditions of humanism in painting was the tradition of painting common folks rather than uh, the aristocracy, using the image uh, as the writer used the language, language close to the language of people, language close to the language of everyday. Uh, people tell us that uh, novels begin in the West when the vernacular, when the conversation, the talk of everyday people, uh, when the foul language of some people in the streets enters into literature and is accepted for its literary value. All of these you find in Saadi, and you find them in a remarkable, uh, successful way. Uh, the irony of it all is that much of the Iranian modernists, many of the advocates of Iranian humanism, have really overlooked Saadi. They have overlooked Saadi by accusing him of being things that we think he is not being things that we actually think he is the opposite of. The idea of eclectically reading a little bit of Saadi and finding something that you find uh, supporting your thesis that, for example, Saadi is uh, advocating clerical power in Iran. The people who actually have written a book in Iran, several books actually, who claim Saadi was an advocate of the Iranian regime, the Layat e the rule of the Jewish Council. Now, Saadi is a Sunni. Saadi has nothing in common with the current uh, form of government in Iran. He doesn't have the secular attention, uh, uh, connection to it, and he absolutely doesn't have the foundational uh, connection to it. Saadi is vigorously against the idea of mixing religion and politics. Saadi is very keen on saying that if you want happiness, uh, you have to allow the spiritual domain to be uh, controlled and not dominated, controlled, advised by religious uh, ideas and the political domain to be dominant by the political. He is fiercely against the idea of one people, one people, one faith, one group, claiming to have an absolute uh, monopoly of virtue and forcing that virtue on other people. He tells a brilliant story that is very relevant to Iran today. And it shows how unlike Iran today, Saadi taught. He describes how he was with his father and uh, his father was a pious man. We know his father was a very pious and they were in a room and most people had slept and were not getting up to say their prayer. And Saadi turns around, the young Saadi turns around to his father and says, what kind of Muslims are these? Why don't they get up and say their prayer? And the father says, you would have done yourself uh, a very positive step in life if you had slept and not bad mouthed these people. Well, heaven and hell is their responsibility. You don't bear responsibility for them. Don't interfere in people's lives. The idea that somebody can take claim and absolutely dominate others by their faith, whether the faith is Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Saudi is very much against that. It is remarkable how uh, tolerant he is towards the plurality of language, how curious the uh, plurality of religion, how curious he is about other religions. There are occasional signs of, unfortunately, anti-Semitism in some of the stories that he tells. Uh, but more often, he is of the opinion that no one has a monopoly of virtue. No one can actually dictate virtue to others. He suggests the humility that is one of the defining characteristics, I think, uh, and we think, of humanism. Humanism begins with the idea that uh, humans are the subject and the object of history. That means humans are the most important part of uh, the story of life. We are in this earth 
because we are humans and the earth is here because we must find a way to live in it and with it. You can find truly uh, remarkable uh, lines in Sa'di that seem to indicate that he is aware that humans don't always take care of the earth, that they uh, must uh, live with and live in. And it is through our cognition, through our critical, constant, rational cognition that we understand the human condition. Sadi says we are a human being, we are an animal human by the fact that we talk. But we are a human by the fact that we uh, talk and think. And we are a correct uh, acting human. We are different than the animals if we think critically and act accordingly, act prudently. Sadi is very much in the Aristotelian tradition of prudence, of avoiding extremes. He's constantly suggesting that those who suggest these extremes don't have a virtue uh, to offer. They are false, they are hypocritical. Uh, and, and almost everything that he touches, and uh, in our uh, book, we, talk, we discuss Saadi's views uh, on religion, Saadi's views on beauty, Saadi's views on love, Saadi's views on uh, politics, Saadi's views on uh, ancient Iran. Uh, these are some of the uh, chapters in the book. And in each of these, you find that humanism, the humanism that says the measure of things are humans. Saadi remarkably says, all that I learned about ethics, all that I learned about virtue, I learned from human beings. I think if somebody says this in Iran today, uh, they might not survive the wrath of the judiciary because in Iran today, uh, positing that all virtue comes from uh, outside and that we humans have no role in all of this is part of the uh, dogma. Saadi is very adamant that he learned all from other human beings and that other human beings, in spite of their difference, in spite of their skin color, in spite of their gender, in spite of their faith, are our equals. They are humans. They must have a share. And their pain is our pain. The phrase that has been often repeated uh, about him that says we are all part of the same timber, the same timber of humanity, uh, is a central part, I think, of his uh, thinking, a central part of his poetry, a central part of his uh, 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 prose, and very much uh, intended to bring both humility and curiosity. He is very much an advocate of absolute curiosity and about the need to change our views. This is part of what humanism is about. Humanism begins to tell us that as subjects and as objects, as thinkers and the subject of thought, we change, the world around us change, our level of maturity changes. The more we think about the world, the more we see of the world, the more we are likely to have different views of the world. Sadi repeatedly talks about how all of his wisdom came from his 30 years of travel and that how this wisdom uh, taught him that what he taught 30 years ago has now changed into something different. And the acceptance of this difference is at the same time, uh, in him at least, the acceptance of a humility, the acceptance of the need to listen to, observe, and coexist with uh, others. Uh, at, at the same time, in terms of um, issues of love, for example, issues of beauty, for example, again, you see this humanism at the core of his writing. Uh, people write about humanism as the age when love becomes legitimate, not just love the divine or love of the divine, but love of two human beings for each other. Love that is not determined by power, love that is not determined by family, love that is not coerced. 
Saadi is remarkable in how 800 years ago talks about how if there is power relationship in a, re in, in a uh, relationship, love cannot be, uh, cannot survive. Love requires equality and requires equality of sexes. Uh, Saadi 800 years ago has a story that always reminds me, several stories that always reminds me of Madame Bovary. Where Madame Bovary, as a masterpiece of 19th century literature, posits a different view of how we judge adultery. Uh, in Madame Bovary, the, the story gives us her view of the world. It isn't just the male-dominated view of the world that blames uh, adultery, what we call adultery, what we call pejoratively adultery, uh, what we call morally pejoratively adultery uh, on a woman. Sadi says 800 years ago that if a woman is unhappy in a relationship, it, the man in that relationship is as responsible as the woman. Sadi is rightfully criticized for some of his misogynist lines. Sadi has some embarrassingly misogynist lines. But Sadi also has some remarkable lines praising women, not praising women for the traditional male uh, shaped views of women that women are kind, women are beautiful, women are good mothers. She, Sadi praises them for their wisdom. Sadi praises them for their prudence. In a story, Sadi places a woman's wisdom not on par, just on par with the prophet of Islam, but puts it one step beyond. She has more patience for diversity than the prophet of Islam has. Sa'di is one of the few poets in Iranian history that has a praised woman, that has uh, essentially eulogized woman, but he has eulogized woman for exactly their human and humanitarian uh, and equal to men rituals, not the kind of rituals that uh, uh, we tend to expect from a kind of a male-centered uh, view. Saadi's view on love are also remarkable because as I said, he often repeats that in love, there cannot be class differentiation. There cannot be hegemony. There needs to be equality. There needs to be understanding. One of the problematic aspects of Saadi's humanism, something that has been talked about in by a lot of people, and this is not unique to Saadi, but Saadi is certainly more uh, cited for it. Uh, it is the notion that Saadi uh, praised young boys, that Saadi was, according to some, a pederast. There is no doubt that there are uh, lines in Saadi in praise of the young beloved that in today's world, by today's standard, would get him in a lot of hard trouble. But what we say in our narrative is that while we should uh, expose these lines, while we should say that this kind of an attitude is problematic, we should also consider how it might well be uh, that what he meant was in the same spirit that Plato meant when he talked in symposium about the beloved, the only true beloved being a young boy. In other words, was he, was he trying to be explaining a platonic love or love in that tradition, the pure perfection, or was he actually talking about this? But we must be critical of him. But we also say that in criticizing Sadi, we must use the same measures that we use in uh, uh, judging others. One of the most remarkable things about Saadi is how many of Iranians, uh, 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 literature, Iran literature, Iranian literature's modernists have been against Saadi. They have accused them of everything from uh, uh, misogyny to being a petty bourgeois, of being a praiser of uh, kings, uh, to uh, be a greedy, uh, to be a hypocrite, 
uh, to be a bad poet. Nima, who should know better, says Saadi's love poetry is pedantic. It's really, it, 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 it doesn't matter much. Uh, Khoi says Saadi isn't even a poet. Uh, uh, he, he plays with words. Others have said Saadi uh, is a jumble of ideas. He doesn't have much to say about the world. Whatever has come to him, whatever aphorism has come to him, he has collected and put in this kashkul, for example. But there is a consistency of thought in Saadi that we think if uh, one looks at critically, uh, not submissively, not hyperbolically, not just praising him for his greatness, criticizing him where he must be, but also realizing that he is a giant. He is a giant, not just in the aesthetic uh, power of his uh, stories and his prose and his uh, uh, poetry, but also the prudence, the wisdom that he brings, the toleration that he brings, his aversion to uh, false piety, his aversion to those who want to rule in the name of false piety. Sadi has a lot of remarkable stories, critical of those who do injustice in the name of uh, delivering uh, religious justice. Uh, one of the more remarkable things is cons his consistency in saying that those who come to this world, come to, this, to, to politics with these kinds of certainties, with these kinds of uh, uh, arrogances, they're not the ones who we should follow. The ones we should follow, he says, are ourselves. More often than not, Saadi invites us to make judgment. One of the great defining characteristics of humanism is aversion to absolute delivered sermons. It is an aversion to the notion that only revealed truth in one book holds the key to all uh, questions. It is an aversion to thinking that only I, whoever that I is, whether it's the church, whether it's the uh, priest, whether it's the king, whether it's the philosopher uh, king, uh, hold the key to heaven and salvation in this world. Uh, humanism essentially accepts the ambiguity in the human condition, accepts the notion that none of us can arrive at the final truth. It accepts the notion that through dialogue, not through monologue, not through sermons, not through false certitudes, not through false pieties, can we arrive at uh, happiness. Happiness is the recognition of the complexities of the world. Happiness is the recognition that we must be humble to accept that sometimes we can never arrive at a final solution. The search, the search in a humble disposition is what humanism, his humanism is all about. Dialogue is central to Saadi. And from dialogue, you get democracy. From dialogue, you get the novel. Uh, we use the writings of Bakhtin, for example, who is considered one of the best theorists of uh, uh, the novel, the history of the novel. And one of the things he posits, Bakhtin posits, is that the novel emerges as a form with modernity, with humanism. In fact, he says the novel is the quintessence of uh, humanism. The novel is the acceptance that every human being, every human being, even a criminal, who goes and kills two older uh, women to think whether he can kill them is worthy of a narrative. Everyone has a narrative and that narrative must be heard, can be heard. There's a complexity in, in, in the novel. There is the laughter at the world in the novel. Novel gets us to think about the world. That's why he says, rightly I think, and Kundera uh, later repeats this, that's why despotism, that's why authoritarian regimes, that's why totalitarian regimes hate the novel, because the novel does not accept absolutes. The novel 
constantly deconstructs, criticizes, shows us the gray zones of life, ideologies, pieties, certainties, medieval world was based on accepted dualities of good and evil. The body is evil, uh, the spirit is good. The heavens are perfection, the earthly is polluted. The saints are perfection, uh, we are sinners. The bad guy in the fairy tale is the embodiment of all evil and the fairy uh, is the embodiment of all good. In the novel, we have no such thing. And Sadi is full of characteristics, characters who are novelistic. He himself, at, as the most important of these characters, these novelistic characters, much of the language that Sadi offers us, Sadi, much of the story structure that Sadi offers us, are tools that I think the, in Persian language can be used and has been used by uh, novelists uh, and by story writers, by playwrights, uh, by filmmakers, from Ibrahim Gulistan, who's one of the best filmmakers, to Bahram Bezoi, who's one of the who, who's best playwright we have, to uh, uh, Golshiri. Many of these people who have tried to use the techniques, the language, the tropes of uh, uh, Sadi in developing their uh, tricks, in developing their tropes, in developing their forms. I say all of this because this has a relevance, both the issue of humanism, the issue of where modernism can come in art, where uh, democracy can come in politics, because all of these are interrelated to the problematic facing Iran over the last 150 years. And that's the question of modernity. Is modernity, and modernity means humanism. Modernity means democracy. Modernity means a novel that has the right to laugh at everybody, including prophets. Modernity means the novel that can write, that laugh at a leader, can laugh at ourselves. Modernity is a poetry that can talk about sex and not worry about being executed. Modernity means a, a kind of a satire that can make fun of anybody and anything without thinking that there's going to be a fatwa on your head or a church edict on, uh, on the door. In, in all of these, in the last 150 years, there have been two tendencies in Iran. One tendency has been advocated by the clergy, mostly, not all the clergy, but most of the clergy, who have said humanism, Renaissance, modernity, uh, equal right for women, for example, pluralism of ideas, all of these are part of the Western tradition. There are the tricks, Mr. Khamenei says, taking his cue from what's a good quote in Egypt. He says, these are the tricks of the crusaders. They want to undermine our belief in Islam. We don't want modernity because it doesn't fit our culture. Another group, in my view, in our view, equally wrong, have been those who, who have said, Iran is a backward country. Iran has a backward culture. There might have been something in the past, way past, but forget about that. You can't hang your head on that. You need to become Western. You need to emulate them. If you want theater, go read Chekhov. If you want a modern stream of consciousness, go read Proust. You have an, that tendency, which is the absolute other side of this other tendency that doesn't accept that modernity is not Western, humanism is not Western. Just a few months ago, uh, the head of Iran's judiciary, who's now uh, uh, off the job, uh, and someone unfortunately worse has gotten the job, uh, who said our error was to accept humanism. Humanism is a Western trick. Our uh, research, I think, shows com com convincingly. Uh, and I have written other things in Persian and in English uh, that tries to cover other aspects of this, that these are false dualities. These are both Eurocentric. Even the most anti-Western clergy are actually Eurocentric. They repeat the narrative of the West. This 
these other intellectuals who say that we must change everything. There is nothing in us that can save us. There is nothing in us from which we can learn democracy. If you want to learn democracy, go read John Locke. No, we want to learn democracy. We must read John Locke, but we must also critically read Sadi. Absolutely, we must read Proust. But in order to learn stream of consciousness, we can read Nizami. We must absolutely read Shakespeare. But Bahram Bezai draws from within the Iranian tradition, a theatrical tradition that is brilliant and as much global as it is local. Golestan says, everyone tells me I took my prose from Hemingway. Hemingway, he says, I was a student of Saadi. I learned from Saadi. I even learned some of my cinematic tricks. I learned at the jump cut from Saadi. We quote him in the book. The book is actually dedicated to him. We quote him in the book. He says, this is where uh, Saadi uh, teaches me uh, the jump cut. Uh, let me end by uh, pointing to another remarkable aspect of Saadi's humanism. It has been said that uh, one of the most uh, remarkably succinct uh, uh, encapsulation of humanism is the ceiling in Sistine Chapel, the creation of Adam, the moment where God's hand is about to meet Adam. Uh, some critics have said, this is really not the biblical story. Although it's in Sistine Chapel, this ain't the biblical story. God exists and humans exist in fully formed uh, bodies. In other words, uh, some have gone further and said, uh, where God sits uh, uh, on top has the look of a brain. And uh, Michelangelo was trying to say that we, uh, the, the creation of man is God. Man is not the creation of man, God, but God is the creation of man. In other words, he was saying, Michelangelo was saying, some, what German philosophers Feuerbach and Hegel and Marx said in 19th century, that religion is a fetishism of the human mind. Whether you accept it as fetishism or not, the point is that it questions that story and posits something remarkable. It posits the idea that humans were there at the moment of creation. Saadi virtually says the same thing several times. Not only Saadi says it, uh, Hafez says it too. Hafez literally has the poet, Saadi has himself watching these moments of creation. That's why he says, what I learned, I learned from human beings. In other words, even the moment of creation, he was there to watch. He is there to help us think. Uh, the traditionalists tell us that Saadi is a sermonizer. Saadi is a remarkable manifestation of what Bakhtin calls dialogical thinking. Thinking based on dialogue, thinking based on common search for an ever-changing uh, reality. For that, we think he not only is a great humanist in the Iranian tradition, but I think a giant in uh, um, world literature, and we quote many people uh, who have in the past compared him favorably to Shakespeare. We too think that uh, he deserves the kind of a praise and the kind of a scrutiny and the kind of a criticism that someone uh, as important as Shakespeare deserves. And unfortunately, those two tendencies that I have told you about have not allowed much in-depth scrutinizing and writing and thinking uh, about uh, Saadi. We still don't have a single credible biography of Saadi. We have very little when you compare to the uh, uh, library of Shakespearean writers and compare it to the meagerness of what has been written about Saadi, you find what is truly tragic. Uh, and hopefully uh, the wonderful news in Iran is that this book has come at the time where there is a Saudi renaissance.
people are reading Saadi more than ever. People are reading it with their own mind, not with the mind of the Western intellectuals who said Saadi is a reactionary or the clerical uh, interpretation that said Saadi is a sermonizer, Saadi is a religious dogmatist. They're reading it with their own mind, and that is the rebirth of humanism. Thank you very much. I've gone five minutes longer than what uh, Ms. Parha told me I should go, so I stop. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, we have a few questions coming in. A few people have asked, what inspired you to write about Saadi? Um, what particularly inspired you to prompt to turn your paper into a book? Oh, I, uh, I, I must be clear. I didn't turn my paper into a book. I wrote that paper. Uh, and uh, I wrote the, the paper I wrote was actually a very close critical reading of chapter one of Golestan. Chapter one of Golestan is about monarchy, uh, and I uh, read it and essentially claimed, uh, whether I've proven it or not, uh, the readers have to judge, I claimed that virtually everything they have said about Saadi's politics is wrong. Saadi wasn't a uh, eulogizer of kings. In fact, he, was, uh, he eulogized them, but he criticized them uh, very, very subtly. Saadi, more often that, than once, maybe, I, truly, maybe 50 times uh, I have counted, tells us about 50 times that uh, I can't tell you everything I need to tell you. You need to read between the lines. I live in dark times. I live in times where the power political or the power clerical kill people for saying bad things. So he's leaving it to us to look to what T.S. Eliot calls the word within the world. And once you begin to read the word within the word of that first chapter, it's a remarkable story different than anything else has been told. Uh, I read it and found that there isn't a single Persian king after the advent of Islam in Iran that Saadi does not think was a brute. Every king that he praises in that chapter is a king that belonged to ancient pre-Islamic Iran, where the notion of dot justice was central to tenets of uh, rulership. Not all the rulers followed that, but it was an accepted. Uh, and Saadi clearly knew, Saadi clearly knew the Zoroastrian past of Iran, played with it, understood it, took um, from Shah Nameh to many others who have tapped into that history. So that was, uh, my take on chapter one of Golestan. After that, I always knew that uh, one needs to read more. And, uh, and I, I love uh, his prose. I love his uh, poetry. And I always uh, was looking for an excuse to spend a fair amount of rigorous time just reading him and reading everything that has been written about him. And about three years ago, I decided uh, when uh, my colleague said, you know, this discussion that we had could be the, the beginning of a discussion of a, about a book. And I thought uh, uh, that is the beginning of something. And it is, uh, I must also say that uh, I truly believe that uh, this book uh, is only the beginning. Sadly needs to be studied in my view with the same type of rigor and the same type of multiplicities of views. I can absolutely believe that someone would read this stuff and come away with a very, very different uh, interpretation. I hope they do, and I hope they criticize our take, and from that, a dialogue will be created, and more people will go read it. I'm convinced when people go read it, uh, they will be as amazed by his uh, brilliance as we have been, and I continue to be. Thank you. A few people are asking when the book might be available in English, and then also what your experience was like publishing the book inside Iran, and if there are concerns about it being censored. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm very much uh, 
considering uh, uh, undertaking the translation, I say I, although uh, uh, my colleague has agreed that it would be wonderful to translate it, uh, I would have to do it because uh, I, I am the only uh, English speaker uh, in this uh, team of uh, authorship. Uh, I'm very keen on trying to do it. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe in the next uh, few months, I will uh, try to uh, get it done. Uh, corona might help uh, when uh, you're uh, in place, uh, you don't go into traffic. Uh, in terms of uh, public uh, publishing in Iran, uh, uh, some of you might know, uh, I have several books that have in the past gotten permission and have been published. Uh, a book on Hoveda, my book on modernity, uh, my translation of Master and Margarita. These have been in print in Iran virtually for the last uh, 20, 30 years. They've been constantly in print, but they, because they had an earlier permission. Uh, my book on the Shah was not permitted to be published and thus I put it on uh, uh, social media and made it available for free download inside Iran. And fortunately, it has been read by many, many, many people. Uh, on this one, uh, we decided that we we're going to write it um, and we're not going to uh, hold too many uh, punches uh, and we're going to see whether it can get published. Uh, our agreement uh, with the publisher was that uh, you submit this text if they accept it in total, uh, we'll publish it. If not, uh, we'll purchase uh, the, uh, the typeset from you and publish it outside, the way I published uh, the book on the Shah outside. Uh, a very dear friend of mine in Canada made that possible. Uh, someone who wasn't in publishing at all, but decided as an act of truth, uh, essentially philanthropy, I think, uh, and started the publishing house and made uh, Nagahi Bashar uh, a book. And then he also published another book uh, from uh, uh, Professor Farzaneh Milani on Farooq al that couldn't get published uh, inside Iran. And we were ready if it doesn't get uh, the permission. But they didn't uh, um, ask us to cut anything. Uh, there are, if you read the book in Persian, I think you will be. Uh, as surprised that it did get, uh, as happy <laughs> that it did get uh, permission. Uh, I'm not sure what will happen to the second printing. The first printing is, as I'm told, finished. Uh, and whether it will get to a second printing inside uh, remains to be seen. But as soon as it doesn't inside Iran, we'll absolutely publish it outside Iran and put it on uh, the, the way we put the Nagali Bashar uh, for people to read inside Iran. Thank you. A uh, few questions uh, along this vein of how you would compare Hafez and Saadi and their influence on Iranian culture. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to make uh, facile comparisons. Uh, I am not uh, an expert on Hafez. I am an avid reader of Hafez. Uh, and I, I leave that to uh, uh, other uh, critics who might make this comparison. Uh, but as an avid reader, of uh, Hafez and an avid reader of uh, Saadi, a more serious reader of Saadi, as someone who studies Saadi much, much more carefully and closely than Hafez. I actually started uh, uh, st writing something about Hafez four years ago, uh, five years ago, and I had a wonderful research assistant who was a graduate student at Stanford, a brilliant, brilliant young man. Uh, and he was helping do some of the kind of things that I was trying to do at the time. Uh, but then I got interested in Saadi because I thought Saadi uh, has a much more complex uh, view of the world, is much, much more versatile in his uh, uh, genres. Uh, Hafez has only written Qazad. They're brilliant, they're stunning, they're miraculous. They're almost impossible to translate because of the complexity of the language, the multiplicity of layers of meaning that uh, exist in that language. But that's also true, I think, in uh, Saadi. Saadi is very difficult to translate in that sense. So um, I think they're, they're, they're different. Uh, I think uh, 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 Saadi is much more uh, of the uh, multi-genre, uh, multi-talented, uh, uh, modern view. Uh, 
Hafez was very averse to traveling. Hafez essentially stayed in the same place and uh, wrote these brilliant uh, love poems that were also critical of uh, clergy uh, and also very praiseful of wine. Uh, I think something, somebody should one day write a book. I, some people have tried, but it hasn't been com comprehensive uh, about how significant both of these themes are. The theme of criticizing uh, piously appearing critics who, as Hafez famously said, they say one thing in uh, public and they do something entirely different when they go in private. Saadi is very critical of that. Hafez is very critical of that. And both of them have taken something from Hayyam, who says, uh, we all die, life is uh, uh, passing, and thus um, uh, things that can save us uh, are creativity, uh, our love, and our wine. Those are three things that I think are sh they, they both share as uh, the only efficient uh, solace to the pain they feel about life, the anxiety about death, the anxiety about uh, the complexities that cannot be uh, understood. Thank you. A viewer is asking, how could Saadi be a humanist when in his poetry he sees those people different from himself as not worthy of a living? Well, I'm, I'm, as I told you, I'm sure somebody can find one uh, uh, line that contradicts uh, 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 the humanist story. Uh, in, in the uh, chapter, the first chapter of the book, we talk about our methodology. And we say, when somebody has written as much as Sadi has, and this is also true about, as I said, I keep comparing it to Shakespeare because I think it's a very apt comparison. This is also true about Shakespeare. Uh, was Shakespeare a misogynist? Was Shakespeare a Catholic? Was Shakespeare a Protestant? Was Shakespeare an atheist? Was Shakespeare a conformist or a revolutionary? Stephen Greenblatt has written brilliantly about Shakespeare. And basically says it's very difficult. It depends on how you look. It depends when you look. It depends what plays uh, you look. Uh, Shakespeare wrote the uh, Taming of the Shrew, which could be considered very profoundly uh, uh, misogynist. But he also has eight or nine plays that he has written named after a woman. Uh, some of the most remarkable characters in theater are, are Shakespeare and woman characters. The same is true about uh, Sadi. Uh, I'm sure there is a passage where uh, he talks about other, there, there are several passages, several poems that lines of poems that you could construe exactly as the kind of a nasty, uh, um, smart, self-assured uh, uh, point of view uh, of uh, a cultural hegemon. But what we say in our uh, methodological chapter is that we follow uh, what Jakobson of literally critic talks about as the dominant uh, in every text, particularly a text that is so complicated uh, and so vast as uh, Saadi is. Uh, there are multiplicities of views, but there is also uh, something that seems to be the more dominant thing. I, I think those lines are there. Uh, they should be criticized. I told you there are lines where uh, uh, they badly stink of uh, anti-Semitism. But there are also lines where uh, he tells a Muslim, who the hell are you to tell uh, a Jew that you're better than him or a Christian or um, in Hindu? So uh, in the reading of the person who has asked that question, obviously those other lines and those other many, many, many stories in Golestan uh, uh, are not the true uh, Sadi. One of the things, again, we have tried to do is uh, we, we argue uh, following many uh, uh, tradition of literary critics saying that not only Sadi uh, keeps telling us that don't listen to the surface. I have to hide this. You know, Borges famously said, uh, censorship is the mother of metaphors. Sadi keeps telling us Hey, uh, 
reader, I'm speaking in metaphors. There's somebody standing at the top of my head and might chop my head off. He literally says this. So it's for us to look for the word within the word. But when you look for the word within the word, you might go wrong. You might be attributing something to him that is your wish. And only through criticism, the criticism of this uh, uh, person who has kindly asked the question, criticism of people who will write the review of this book, uh, our criticism of others who have seen uh, Saadi in different ways, uh, can we begin to arrive at a better understanding? We can't ever arrive at the true understanding. Even if you ask Saadi what the true meaning of his <laughs> life work is, we actually make this argument following many literary critics that oftentimes if you ask writers, what their book is about, they almost always sound more stupid than the book. The book has a life and intelligence far greater, any good book. Sometimes books are unfortunately uh, much uh, less smart than their uh, authors, but great books almost invariably are smarter than their writer. Uh, Sadi talks about things that uh, we think, for example, have elements of uh, uh, psychology in it elements of 19th century philosophy in it. If you ask that, did you know Hegel? He said, who the hell is Hegel? Does that mean that reading that we have isn't there? No, Saadi doesn't know it. So again, to compare to, to Shakespeare, for 400 years, people performed Hamlet. Nobody thought Hamlet's problem is that he's an edible complex, till Freud comes around. And it completely changes the way. So, only out of an evolving and conflicting and dialogically uh, changing uh, interpretations can we arrive at uh, approximations and then future generations will change. You know, every generation, every age has a different reading of the classics. What we understand from Shahnameh today is very different than what they understood about Shah Nameh 150 years ago. Today, everybody is, uh, not everybody, a lot of people are reading about uh, not the, the letter of uh, uh, Rostam to his brother talking about these Arabs who have come to destroy the, an earlier age that wasn't facing a theocracy would read different parts of Shah Nameh. Uh, same with Saadi, I think. Thank you. Why is Saadi not well known in the Western world, in your opinion? Well, uh, first of all, as I said, at one time he was, uh, but Saadi is not well known in the Western world because uh, I think uh, the responsibility is primarily uh, on uh, Iranian writers, uh, scholars, and intellectuals. We have failed to represent the Iranian culture the way it needs to be represented. Uh, many of us have felt that there isn't much there to represent. Some of us have gone hyperbolic and saying, uh, quoting uh, uh, Shah Nameh, that uh, all that is beautiful comes from Iran. Hunar nazi Iran, No, Hunar is not only in Iran, but a hell of a lot of brilliant Hunar and architecture and carpet and writing and poetry and philosophy has come from Iran. And we have failed, we being the Iranian uh, people who, Iranian intellectuals, Iranian historians, Iranian scholars, we haven't done a good enough job. We haven't yet written, as I said, a biography of Saadi. I know it's difficult because every uh, bastard who has come to Shiraz and dominated Shiraz destroyed half of the libraries. The other one destroyed the papers. It's very difficult to get at some of these things. But there is a lot of stuff in our libraries that not, we haven't yet gotten to. And our uh, uh, inability to, uh, our, our unwillingness to do the work has left some of these people, I, I think, uh, uh, stranded. Uh, although, as I said, in the 19th century, uh, Saadi was a very famous uh, uh, poet. Uh, Emerson knew about him 
and uh, wanted to learn Persian. Goethe wrote a whole uh, Eastern Divan inspired by Saadi and Hafez. The president of France in late 19th century uh, was named after Saadi. A great physicist was named Saadi. Literally, a French scholar was called Saadi uh, something. A president was, that's how uh, household name he was. Now it has become obscure because uh, many of the people at that time who were interested in uh, Saadi were looking at Saadi for an exotic oriental uh, spiritual. I, I still read how Saadi, many of these people who write about Saadi, Saadi, this mystic, this oriental, uh, they took in, late, in that late 19th century, they took one of the most brilliant, one of the most iconoclastic poets of Iranian history, Hayyam, and turned him into a Sufi in the hands of somebody who made the translation, made a great translation, but left very little of uh, Hayyam. And we have done very little in uh, introducing uh, these people uh, and finding a language, uh, I mean, uh, part of it is because we haven't really done enough work, but part of it is also uh, because of uh, the complexity of uh, the poetic language. I mean, Hafiz is very difficult to translate. Saadi is very difficult. Saadi is easier than Hafiz, but, but it is remarkable that echoes that he uses, uh, some of the uh, uh, plays that he has between meanings and sounds and layers and under layers and context it is very, very, very difficult to translate. The same way it's very difficult to translate Shakespeare into Persian. Thank you. Well, we still have many more questions and unfortunately we're running out of time, uh, but everyone I hope will stay tuned for when we announce the Farsi version of the talk and maybe we can pick up some of the questions there. Um, I wanna thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Professor Milani for the talk. Um, and we will see you again soon. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Good night, everyone.